I have heard tale of the giant Ohio land lobster and have decided to try to capture one myself. Or I've made some cages for my wife's strawberries to keep the deer and other critters out of there. Uh, if you stick around, you'll find out which one of them's true. Stand by. Well, it appears we've survived another winter here in South Central Ohio. And uh, the hostas are coming up, the bleeding hearts are coming up, uh, flowers are starting to poke out, grasses are starting to green up. And that can really mean only one thing. That's right, it's garden time. And Mrs. Rattlecan would like some protective cages over the strawberry beds keep them pesky deer away. So while she's out of town, we're gonna see what we can do. Stand by. Hey everybody, welcome back to Mrs. Rattlecan's house. I am James and if you are watching this, then you have more than likely survived winter. I don't know what yours was like. Some parts of the country, it has been absolutely atrocious. Some places like here, it's been fairly mediocre. Um, if you're watching this and you haven't survived winter, um, that means that you're probably dead. Uh, and if you're actually you're dead and you're watching this, then uh, that means you're a zombie and you probably have bigger problems than deer in your strawberry beds. So if you need to go, you know, take care of things and come back later, we'll understand. Anyways, Mrs. Rattlecan uh, has got two strawberry beds on the side of the house. And we have noticed last year, we have an issue with critters getting into the strawberry beds and eating them before we can. And, you know, I know that's probably pretty selfish of me, but I would like to reap the fruits of my labor. So she has asked for a cage. And that's basically all she said. So what I have done is I've sat down and I have fabric cobbled up this design and I'll, I'll put a better picture of it up here. Um, but this is what we're going to work off of. We're gonna work off of the, uh, uh, the cocktail lounge print, uh, which a lot, of, uh, a lot of things that I do, uh, that's more the planning that we do instead of all the fancy stuff that we do on the computer for the shop. So anyways, we're gonna make this out of uh, one by two Western Red Cedar. We are going to join it with pocket screws and outdoor glue. It's basically just a frame. And in the middle part here, this is gonna be chicken wire. Now that will keep deer out and rabbits and squirrels and birds. And uh, it will allow in uh, the things that we want to show up, uh, which is the pollinators. I came up with a cut list. Again, I'll show you a picture of this. Uh, I went over, uh, there's a guy named Jonathan Overholt that's got a cut list calculator that I have used on projects before, and uh, I'm quite happy with it. You fill out this website and you tell it what is the nominal size 
that you're looking for. You're looking for one by twos, two by fours, you know, two by sixes, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you tell it the length that is available to you, and then you start telling it the pieces that you need. And it will go through and calculate uh, on exactly which board you're going to get out of here. Uh, so, um, for example, on this top board, because the boards I got are they're 96 inches or eight feet long, um, I've got a I've got a kerf of of an eighth of an inch. Kerf is how much the blade uh, chews up um, on each cut. So I lose an eighth of an inch on each cut. And uh, it tells me on this one board, I am going to get one 72 inch board and one 23 inch board. Uh, my cut loss is gonna be a quarter of an inch and I'm gonna have three quarters of an inch left over. And it will tell you every single board down the list what you have to cut out of that. So when you're done with this, you should have a pile of lumber in all of the sizes that you need. So we're gonna go retrieve uh, that cedar from the garage and drag it over here to the guitar shop and get to chopping. Some of you may have noticed I appear to have a little hitch in my giddy up. And sometime after Christmas, my knees, both of them, have decided they're done. So we've had all kinds of tests and imaging and just general frivolity. And we'll see what they're gonna say about what we're gonna do. So my first board says I need a 72 inch piece. And then I'm gonna need a 23 inch piece. We're going to see because one of the things that we have to do when we are you know, you go to the lumber store and you and you pick out, you know, the straightest, least, least banana-like lumber that you can get, which is sometimes hard. Um, then you let it acclimate in your shop for a few days, so we get to the, the humidity level that we're going to be working in. And then, just because this one board says I'm going to have a 72-inch board and a 23-inch board, I might not. And the reason is that is not such a big deal. This is biggest deal -less. This might not fit into my cunning plan. So actually, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna pick another board. So let's see if we can find, because I've got, I have to pick eight, to pick eight of these 72 inch long boards, but I would like to not have to pick that piece of wood Because that's going to give me two It's going to give me a weird a weird knot in the middle of that and I would rather not do that. So We're going to use this one Which doesn't have the giant boo-boo in the middle of it a 72 inches Then we'll get a 23 inch piece out of that. And then we're going to start stacking them up. I should probably get this table configured so that I can do that. So give me half a second. Uh, I know some of you will cry when I say this. I'm gonna stop yammering. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna do some work here.
And through the wonder of movie magic, there are all my pieces cut out. Now, <clears throat> we all know me, so I've ordered two extra pieces, partially in case I can't measure. Part of it is in case I hit a knot on the end of something, which I think I've did that a couple of times. I could have substituted, but I wasn't quite sure. Always like to err on the side of caution. And here's the nice thing about one of those cut list generators. This is my scrap. Out of 20 pieces of cedar, that is all that's excess. And, you know, well, it'll make a great fire at some point. So now let's get stuff moved over um, and we'll talk about what we're going to do next. All right, we're going to do a test. If you follow the channel for any amount of time, you'll know that I'm big into testing and making sure that things work. If you really wanted to test this out, you probably should have done this before you got this far. But anyways, this is a piece of our frame material and I have marked a center line in there and I have lined it up with this center line mark on my Craig jig. I'm going to drill a couple of holes and then we're going to see if it will screw into uh, the piece of wood that we're looking to affixate. two pocket holes. So now what we have is uh, this is just a this is just a square that I use when we're doing metal fabrication and what I'm done is just used a two inch we call this a pony clamp or a spring clamp. It's apparently some sort of murder hornet uh, coming around here and I have these clamped into here to keep that at a 90 degree angle so we're gonna drop stuff so I have to bend over. This is what we're using. We're using uh, Craig screws. These are coated for outdoor use. And we're gonna see if we're able to get this attached and affixated. So I was hoping this, I've got a, this is a, this is a, a power screwdriver. Um, it does not have a lot of torque to it. Um, I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to avoid um, using um, the impact because I know the impact is just going to beat the snot out of this thing. So there we go. We're cinched up there. And... We're cinched up there. So now let's Okay. I think that's pretty sturdy. So that's what we're going to do. Although what I am going to do, just because you guys know how I am, we're going to put a little dab of tight bond uh, three. Is it three? Three. The green stuff. This is the the outdoor glue, um, just because you know screws can back off sometimes. So uh, we're going to start. We're going to clean off a little area. Actually, I think we're going to go into the garage and start doing this because right now the sun is starting to pound inside the shop and it's starting to get a little warm. So stand by. We'll reset. So I've looked at the plan and we have to put two Craig holes, pocket holes, in the ends of each side of all of these pieces because these are the, the interior parts. Now, earlier on I told you that I had bought extra just in case I ran into something. Do you, do you see it? If you look right here, 
we have two of these pieces that have a knot right in the end of them. And uh, believe you me, when we were cutting through them with the circular saw, uh, they did not go easy because knots are hard. Uh, knots are the kind of things that um, chip your carbide blades on your planer or your joiner at work. So uh, I'm going to recut these two. I'm actually going to inspect all of these, make sure that I don't, these are the only two that I have, and I will recut these. And then we're going to get to putting in the pocket hole jigs. Let me show you what I've done. Put this piece back in with it centered. And what I have done is I have lined up uh, a guide. So when I want to put this, put each one of these pieces in, I can just put it in here, get it lined up with the edge of that tape, square on the bottom, and now I'm in the middle, I can drill my two holes. So cue the time-lapse footage. All right, next day, we have changed locations. We are now in the garage, a little more room to spread out. And we're gonna talk quickly. I'm gonna attempt to dump everything I know about uh, pocket hole joinery, which is not much, uh, out here for your benefit. We may condense this later on into a short Craig only, pocket hole only video, but right now it's consider it a bonus. Anyways, um, we're talking about butt joints and a butt joint is like this. And you have some sort of a fastener that comes through like this and eh, they kind of work okay. So what we're gonna talk about today is a pocket hole. And a pocket hole is what you'll see. So we're gonna talk about what makes it better using a pocket hole. You may have seen these on the underside of some of your furniture. And this hole is made using this bit. And this bit has a shoulder in it. And I have a cutaway that I made just for you that will explain why that makes this kind of a cool deal. So inside of here, I've made us a cutaway. Right here, yeah, right there, there's that flat shoulder that I mentioned. And when we drive a special screw in here, you will see the threaded section is going through now we're up onto a smooth shoulder and now the flat edge of this screw is pulling against the shoulder. The threads are pulling it into this piece of wood at an angle and it is tightening this joint up quite nicely. A couple of things you have to keep in mind. Number one, if you're going to use pocket holes, use pocket hole screws. If you use regular screws, they have a taper up here on the top very often, that's not gonna work. Uh, second thing, you will notice that these have a square-ish head on them. <laughs> There's a square head on there. That's actually called a Robertson um, bit. And it's not just a straight down square, it has a taper and on the bit, it also has a slight taper on it and that allows you to easily get it to engage and disengage. Now, if you look at this, it comes with the Craig kits, it's gonna tell you it's a number two Craig. What does it say? It says it's right there. It's a number two Craig. But fear not, this is also known as a number two Robertson. 
So if for some reason you need to get a replacement, um, there may or may not be a price difference between a number two Craig bit and a number two Robertson bit. Just kind of keep that in mind. Uh, what else can we teach you? Uh, how do you know how far to drill this in? You have a collar here. They give you a handy dandy tool. You hold it up onto the thickness of the wood that you are going to use. Notice how this falls into the three quarter category. We adjust our collar so that it shows the three quarter. Uh, I have an older, I have an older collar and it doesn't have that hole and it doesn't have any markings on there. So they have improved this for some of us who don't like to read instructions. And uh, they made it a little bit easier for you to set the correct depth on there. When you drill in, there's a couple of different ways you can do it. This is the simplest of uh, the holders from Craig. It'll clamp onto there, and then you will drill this down through there, and it will make the appropriate looking hole, like that. You can also get what you've seen me use earlier, which is this, same type of thing. We put our wood in there, we give it a clampy clamp, and then drill, drill. Now we have our two pocket holes. Something you may or may not know is there are two types of threads. For your Craig screws. This is Western Red Cedar, which is a softwood. Cedar, pine, fir, uh, any of your, they call softwoods. You will notice this has quite the coarse thread. Now if you're using hardwoods, there's a different screw. It has much finer threads on it. Does it make a difference? It does make a difference. Because if you use a coarse thread Craig screw on usually a very dry piece of hardwood, it'll split your hardwood open. Ask me how I know. Uh, another way that you can keep your wood from splitting, and it will split, ask me how I know, there's a couple of different tactics. One, is you can just use some paste wax, put it on the end of your screw like that, and then when it goes in, it will go in a little smoother and possibly keep it from tearing up. The other thing that you can do, and I know this is going to be painful for some of you, is you cannot use this because this is gonna drive it in there with uh, extreme prejudice, um, especially if you're a little ham-fisted on the trigger finger and that's going to drive it into and split that piece of wood. Ask me how I know. So even though it slows you down, honestly, I think this is your best bet. If you're just, if you're just kind of exploring the world of uh, pocket hole joinery, start with this because you will be able to hear when you'll feel how that is tightening up, you will feel when that shoulder connects up like so. You'll feel it tighten up and you give it just a little bit of a, you know, hey, how you doing? And then you're done. It's difficult to feel with uh, a drill driver. My two cents, we're all adults here. You can do whatever the heck you want to do. So that is, uh, I think that's probably about all I know about pocket hole joinery. So go forth, join, and uh, try not to split your wood. I'll admit to you, at this point, I've probably had more fun in my life. 
Despite all the precautions that I just told you about and looking up some others to try to see if I was missing anything, which I really wasn't, um, I'm still having issues with this cedar wanting to crack. So you can see every clamp is where uh, it has cracked uh, putting the screws in. And it doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, I've, I've done them with the, with the power bit, um, but uh, even going gingerly, uh, you know, with my gentle, tender hands, uh, they're still splitting. And as soon as they split, well, there's not a lot I can do. Uh, I just glue them back, glue it back together, and uh, we'll just kind of continue on. So that has um, led us to discovery of a second problem. Let me tell you about that. So a smart man during the design process would have figured out how he was going to join these two panels and probably would have wrestled and hemmed and hawed and gnashed his teeth or her teeth, somebody's gnashing teeth, uh, until they came up with a solution. But uh, that takes uh, foresight and planning, which are traits that uh, sometimes I don't possess in abundance. So I thought and thought and thought and thought, and I got a cramp in my brain, so I ate a sandwich. And uh, let me show you what I have kind of come up with. The problem we're presented with is I have a piece of wood as such, and then I have another piece of wood as such, and I need to join those two pieces of wood. Now, problem number one, I have pocket screws going up in this direction. So starting about here, I have metal in there that, um, I'm not a smart man, but I'm thinking metal and metal attempting to occupy the same space in split prone wood, not a good idea. So I was noticing this, which is that cutout of the uh, how the pocket hole is, is kind of structured with that little shoulder in there. And I said to myself, self, can you not use that feature except in not an angular manner? So what I did, just as a test, is I took a drill bit and I found one that is the size, just a tiny bit smaller than the solid metal shaft in this screw so that when I hold it up like this, I can see the screw threads on either side uh, of, uh, uh, of the screw. And I used this as a pilot bit and I pre-drilled it to this depth. Why did I pre-drill it to this depth? Well, that's how far this is gonna go. Okay, now, the other thing that I did is I did a test and I adjusted the depth of my collar on my drill bit from the Craig system. So what this does now is when I put this in the pilot hole and drill through, it only goes through that far. So it has not come out of the end. And what I have done is I have created a little shelf down there, a little shoulder for that screw to pull upon. And I then took a screw and drove it through and it goes to about right there. And I did that twice and believe it or not, the stupid thing works. So what I've done is I have pulled this side frame tight against the end of this frame. And in theory, 
going to work. Now, it's probably not the, I'm sure the Craig people are, I'm sure somebody's having a conniption. Um, but that's kind of what uh, being a maker and a DIYer is really all about, is you get presented with a problem and you look at the tools that you have on hand and you attempt to solve that problem. And sometimes that means you got to use a wrench as a hammer. Or in this case, uh, you take the angle out of a pocket hole jig and you make it pull straight down. So we're going to see if uh, uh, this is going to work and if this solution is one that is going to allow us to uh, carry on. All right, we're back. Uh, well, it's been a week because my schedule is insane. I think I might have figured something out. The problem I'm having is that as I'm driving my Craig screws in, I'm still splitting the ends of these small one by twos. And uh, I'll put a picture up here. This is what it looks like. Whenever that happens, I end up going back in, filling that crack with glue, clamping it together, and that you know delays me on, on working that part for like a day because it just you, know, you gotta wait for the glue to set. So kind of banging my head trying to figure out what I could do differently to make this go better. And I got to thinking, if only there was a way that I could squeeze the ends of this together so that when the screw drives into that pocket and into this piece, the wood doesn't even have the chance to expand. And then I remembered that in my Craig kit, I have this. Now this was used to hold my original single, uh, single bushing um, uh, Craig template together. But what I figured out is I can do this. And now I've got pressure on either side of this. And when I drive my screws in, the wood doesn't have the chance to do you know, open up like that because it's constrained on either side. So I've explained to you what uh, I was doing. Now I'm going to, I'm going to show you and we'll see, we'll see if it works. It's worked once, but that doesn't mean anything. We'll see if we can repeat, um, repeat the action. Green label, tight bond. Clamp there, clamp here, and now let's drive some screws in. Got the wax on them. There we go, see that? So the head of the screw has just hit up on that shoulder and squeezed out a little bit of glue. Same thing there, a little bit of tension. And look, no crack. Well, yay me. We may have figured that out. You know, you only know what you know. All right, as you can see, we have completed the assembly. Let me scoot you around a little bit here. We had a little measurement faux pas on uh, one of them. And it's fine. It's kind of the way it goes sometimes. Measure four or five times and then cut once. 
Uh, the long lengths of the frame, which you can see like right there and over there, those big long stretches, those have got three uh, Craig screws uh, the same way that I've attached the sides here. Remember I showed you how we kind of got that going and the clamp on the end seems to have solved the splitting problem. So uh, if you're going to do a project like this in order to minimize splitting of that thin wood, remember uh, use a hand driver. Don't use a power screwdriver because the oogadugas will just split it in half. Make sure to wax your screws. Uh, go slow when you're screwing them in. Once they start to snug up, you're done. And uh, use that uh, Craig clamp or another similar clamp that has a, you know, a decent sized pad on it to compress the area that you're driving that screw into so that the wood just got nowhere to go. It can't split if uh, physics says uh, we're not moving. So now we're going to wander out to the, uh, the shed and uh, root around up in the uh, storage space up above there and try to find some chicken wire because I almost put the hinge on these yesterday and then I thought as much fun as it's going to be turning these over and securing the chicken wire from the inside, it's probably a lot easier to do it when they're individual pieces and not an assembly. So I'm going to go do that. All right, now this part's kind of straightforward, but uh, if you've never worked with any of this kind of wire, hardware cloth or chicken wire or anything like that, once you start cutting these ends, it's like a, it's like a herd of puppies with milk teeth uh, just nipping at you all the time. So uh, where are the glovage? If you're a grown person, you can do what you want to do. I'm just telling you, it's not going to be fun. So, all we have to do now, don't you like how I say that? All we have to do, like it's nothing, is attach this here chicken wire to the inside of this frame. Now luckily we've got these little ledges, and double lucky, this just happens to be the correct width. And that is why the internet is such an amazing thing. So you can watch somebody staple chicken wire on the inside of a strawberry cage on your leisure time. Anyways, we'll continue on with this. Now when you get down here towards the end, just kind of get it in there the best. Oh, you know what I should have done? I should have done this over on the other end. Consider that a free lesson from your friend, the spouse of Mrs. Rattlecan. Now, a word of advice. You see that knot right there? If you're thinking about putting a staple there, don't, because that bad boy is hard as a coffin nail and it will give you grief. Grief like a, grief like a teenager does. and staple it right over the top here. I just realized you can't see anything my hand's doing because you're looking down here and I'm working up here.
take two. <clears throat> I've folded these over and if they continue, you know, if they start, you know, poking, poking flesh parts, then we could take another piece of just this one by and we could lay it on the inside of here and uh, join those together. And then we, you wouldn't have to worry about getting your fingers ed up on that. So I'm now gonna do the other end of that, which I should have done the first time. And then we'll do the other one in one fell swoop. And then, then it'll get fun because then we gotta start kind of piecing this stuff together. All right, we have secured our uh, chicken wire and I have cut this hinge uh, to length. And now we get to do this amazingly fun job of pre-drilling and screwing in holes. Okay, this is just the wrong tool for this. All right, now that we have played musical power tools, again, we're pre-drilling. Why are we pre-drilling? So we don't crack the wood. And I have my drill on its slowest speed. It's a two-speed drill. And I've also got the clutch um, opened up all the way, so uh, we may have to adjust that. Well, I think that'll work just right. All right, we only have to do that uh, 68 more times. But the idea is that the back part of this apparatus is connected to the uh, strawberry bed. And when Mrs. Randall Kane wants to harvest it, then she can lift this up. It will tilt back, rest against the side of my shop. It will not tip over like that. And then when she's done, you can put the Dissuader 6000 uh, back down. I'm not gonna bore you with watching me uh, put the hinge on this other one. Just know that I did it. And uh, I will meet you at the strawberry beds, which are that direction. And uh, here they are. Uh, if you have been following the channel, these are the submerged irrigation beds that we have built. Um, and these are temporarily set up here. Uh, I forgot to take into account the irrigation tube. You can see that white piece of uh, PVC. All of the beds have those on the left. And that's how we fill our beds. And then on the right, you can see uh, each of the bed has an, has an overflow drain. Well, I forgot about that. And so that is limiting my movement uh, over to the right. So what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to put a spacer in on the inside of the bed so that the side of this will rest on that. And then the back of it, we're just gonna zip tie on and then uh, with you know very little effort, uh, I mean, Mrs. Rattlecan has already been out here and already done the happy, uh, this is acceptable uh, dance. And 
So there we go. That is uh, strawberry cages to keep vermin out of uh, our strawberry patches. So, anyways, uh, I'm James. This is Mrs. Rattlecan's house. Remember, if I could do it, you can do it because I'm just a guy. There's nothing special about me. Uh, if I had to do something different, I would have, I would have tested um, the joint method on these before I got all the way through the first one, before I figured it out. I would have tested more. But, uh, you know, that's the great thing about watching this is you have the benefit of uh, my mistakes. And so now you don't have to make one that's got cracked corners all over the place because now you know how to do it because I already screwed it up for you. Anyways, uh, you guys have a great weekend. Get out there and do something, and uh, we will talk at you later. Cheers. If you enjoyed watching this episode of Mrs. Rattlecan's House, consider checking out this video. Be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and to get the latest updates on our progress, like us on Facebook. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon. Perhaps we should have some wine. Ha <laughs> ha!